Hello, Hello everybody. everybody. Hi. Good afternoon, Hi, everyone. everybody. Everyone. <laughs> Big welcome from all our speakers today and good afternoon to everybody listening in. Very warm welcome to you to Petroculture Inspire the World, a series of global online events which showcases creativity, ingenuity, and passion around the world during the global COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Alan Lau, and I'll be your MC today. And you've just seen the beautiful faces of all our panelists right here. So welcome, everybody. Hello. 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 <laughs> well, you might think you've logged on to watch an installation of Pecha Kucha, and indeed you have, but today it's also an installation of Pecha Kuching. Today we're coming to you live from the beautiful city of Kuching, capital of the state of Sarawak in Malaysia on the tropical island of Borneo. This Pecha Kucha event is brought to you by Pecha Kucha Kuching. This is our ninth crackling installation here. And Pecha Kucha Kota Kinabalu, or KK for short, our beautiful eye candy neighbor to the north. So lots of K's and C's in this presentation, see if you can pick them out. We'd also like to give special thanks to IDC Architects, to Element Sendirian Bahad, as well as to Brian Peterson and Ashley Klein and all the team at Petrikacha for their very kind support and very hard work. We have a veritable cornucopia of talented speakers for you today, comprising educators, designers, and architects from all over Asia, including presenters from Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, and of course, Malaysia. And now, for those that aren't familiar with Pechakacha, if you find it a confusing catchphrase, here's a quick catch-up. What exactly is Pechakucha? Pechakucha 20 by 20 is a simple presentation format in which each speaker narrates over a slideshow of 20 images, each image lasting exactly 20 seconds. First devised by Klein Dytham Architecture, the first Pechakucha night was held in Tokyo on February 20, 2003. Pecha Kucha Nights now happen in over 1,235 cities around the world. They are informal and fun gatherings where creative people get together and share their ideas, works, thoughts, holiday snaps, or anything that they feel passionate about using the 20 by 20 format. Well, for those who are unable to join us this afternoon, fear not, the full live stream will remain available on YouTube after this, and the presentations are also available on the pechakucha.com website. Now, anybody can make a Petrikacha presentation using the new PK Create tool that allows everybody to upload 20 images, voice them, publish, and share them with the world. But before we begin, let's get all our speakers together in a single gallery shot. We're going to take one of Petrikacha's shot, group shots together. Uh, so, uh, August, if you could bring, yes, there we are, all your beautiful faces. Everybody give a big wave or a thumbs up. Terrific, beautiful. And so without further ado, let's get cracking. Our first speaker of the day is Astrid Klein. Astrid, uh, are you there? Yes, here I am already. Welcome, Welcome Astrid, so good to hear your voice. While All Astrid right. gets ready, here's a snippet of information about her. Astrid Klein is of Klein Dytham Architecture from Tokyo, Japan. After earning a master's degree from the Royal College of Art in London, Astrid was drawn to Tokyo, where she began working for Toyo Ito. There in 1991, she co-founded Klein Dytham Architecture with Mark Dytham. Astrid is a frequent guest at international conferences on design and architecture, and has lectured or held teaching positions at universities in Japan, the UK, USA, Australia, and throughout Europe. So everybody, please give a very warm welcome to our first inaugural speaker of the day, Astrid Klein. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Alan. That was nice. Uh, uh, not much uh, public speaking these days uh, and not ma many Pechakcha event, live Pechakcha events in public. Uh, but it's really amazing how, uh, how Pechakcha, the, uh, the format, has kind of brought us together in, a, in an even more international way it, than, than we ever imagined before. So uh, uh, through this Pechakcha Inspire, the world uh, series. So I'm kind of really uh, happy to talk today. Uh, I'm ready. So architecture uh, it, as an art is what I'd like to talk today. Uh, we kind of, as architects, we all uh, uh, aspire to do iconic buildings that are kind of uh, more sculptural, and that's important because uh, 
it should appeal to emotions and experiences. And uh, that's what we strive for at uh, Klein Dyson Architecture. And uh, uh, this being a leaf chapel, uh, most iconic, uh, it's been uh, uh, so photogenic over the years. It's an 11 ton uh, veil, steel veil that opens within 38 seconds. And it kind of just wows you uh by its uh by its technology uh and look uh after the uh wedding uh there is a party space in uh in this uh beautiful uh, uh building that actually rather than standing out iconically we hope to make this appear in the woods by reflecting uh, the beautiful trees around it this one is a police station now that one needs to stand out and so we kind of uh, wanted it to stand out in a in a beautiful more uh, sculptural way it's seen from 330 uh, uh, 360 degrees and uh, it's beautiful and colorful rather than uh, your dark police station look. Uh, this one is Ginza Place in Tokyo uh, on the uh, uh, most iconic uh, street con uh, crossing of Tokyo, Ginza Fortrome, and it has 5,313 aluminum panels uh, who all kind of move uh, in, in, in an earthquake and it's uh, beautiful to, uh, to look at. This is Teesside and it's been a bit of a landmark uh, for bookstores around the world. It uh, takes uh, its uh, shape from uh, the uh, tea of Tsutaya and you can just glance uh, the, the, the tea shape on the buildings. Uh, but just in case, uh, uh, if you get closer, we reinforce the, the, the T of, uh, of T side uh, by this uh, uh, reinforced uh, concrete, fretted T, uh, reinforced concrete panels uh, that make the building look less solid and, uh, and more um, light, I should say. Um, it's uh, it always makes for an for a for a good experience and a memorable uh, experience when you have a beautiful uh, landscape around the building. And uh, this is in Karuizawa on uh, at the edge of a pond, uh, and so it really beautifully reflects uh, in the pond. And you 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 just want to have your 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 brunch here sitting in the sun and taking it easy listening to the bird songs and uh, uh, and relax and uh, in winter uh, this uh, freezes over uh, to an ice rink and uh, uh, it it's beautiful then as well uh, landscape is so important. Location, location, location. This is where we all want to be right now. And uh, uh, this is a little um, activity center or clubhouse uh, in a in in hot in between two hotel uh, uh, hotel complexes. And uh, it's it's just beautiful the way you sit under these big cone roofs. There was no need to do these big cone roofs, but it somehow envelopes you and uh, you feel kind of protected. And even on a very uh, rainy day, uh, it, it feels just beautiful to, to look outside. Uh, again, similar, uh, this uh, uh, building we did, we've done for Home for All, where uh, it's all in the roof. And just because this round roof, round shaped roof that envelopes everybody, everybody would like to kind of get together or spend time underneath uh, that beautiful floppy hat uh, roof in the park. Um, sometimes uh, it's... Uh, it's in the floor, and this is in a, 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 sea res a seaside resort uh, close to Tokyo, but it's up on the mountain and uh, so long away from the beach. So we just thought we bring the beach inside by having a, a whole floor covered in sand. And uh, uh, in the same resort, uh, which is actually known for a lot of uh, fireworks, there's nothing better, better than having your dinner 
under your own private firework. And the art here is uh, on the uh, on the steel tubes, uh, the beautiful gradation that the uh, craftsmen have been putting on. Uh, here, I mean, it's it always wows when uh, uh, there is a, a, a very sophisticated craftsmanship going on, like in these laser cut panels for open house uh, in in Central Embassy in Bangkok. And uh, but the real art here is is in the ceiling. And uh, uh, Bangkok is a hot place, and uh, you know uh, it's so hot you want to to be, uh, uh, this becomes an inside, indoor oasis. And so we sort of uh, uh, painting uh, a lot of uh, leaves on the ceiling, uh, which initially uh, uh, we sort of putting up a graphic paper, uh, but that would then with the humidity uh, peel off. And uh, the client uh, uh, luckily said, oh, don't worry, we'll just paint them on one by one. Uh, at which point we say, oh my God, what did we do? Uh, but uh, uh, so they said, oh, we have uh, lots of uh, art students who gladly uh, would paint a seal. I'm not so sure about that, but in any case, uh, the night crew uh, projected the leaves on the ceiling uh, and, with, uh, and traced them with pencil. And then the day crew, uh, uh, painted uh, painted the uh, the outlines of the leaves one by one, and that made for such a lovely uh, part of this project. Uh, it made it, it made it even more precious, uh, knowing that the, all these leaves were hand painted, and all the people who participated in painting could be proudly uh, part of uh, this project and painting it uh, and pointing it out to their family and friends. We sometimes also do little fun uh, um, uh, installations like uh, this collaboration with uh, 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 Sean the Sheep for a charity for Children's Hospital. Uh, we kind of uh, dressed Sean the Sheep uh, with uh, uh, tuna and uh, okura crown, norimaki. Yes, that was me. <laughs> Oh, bravo, Astrid. <laughs> oh, I haven't been doing a Pechakcha presentation in so long. <laughs> thank you, Astrid, so much for those ravishing images. Uh, thank, thank you for caressing the eye. I feel like I want to go there and see these wonderful places and, with, and experience them with all my sen other senses as well. So please give a round of applause for Astrid. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we're off to a cracking start today. So we're going on to our second speaker for the today, uh, Tina Lau from IDC Architects. Tina, can you, can you, are you ready? Yes. Hi, Alan. Hi, I'm ready. nice to see you. Okay. Well, a little bit about Tina. She describes herself as an architect who likes to laugh, mostly at herself. This time, she brings local identity and culture to the pedestal to create a design language that will resonate with all walks of life. And her presentation topic for today is local identity. So over to you, Tina. All right. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for that welcome. Um, right. Okay. So I'm Tina. I'm an architect. With, um, I've been practicing for more than 15 years now, um, both in Australia and Malaysia, um, based in the city of Kuching on the island of Borneo. Um, basically, we, as a design practice, we're often looking at our um, sort of a local culture and rich heritage for design inspirations. In a way, we're trying to sort of create a new design language that's specific for a place. In 2018, we were invited uh, to the Rainforest Fringe Festival to take part in an art installation called Forbidden Fruits. We collaborated together with three organizations, Tonotti, Edric Ong, and Rani. Basically, these organizations work very closely with indigenous um, weaving communities. And so we basically collaborated together to um, help to sort of look at how we could basically express these traditional with tan baskets in a way that would restore 
sort of like their relevance in today's times. Um, so from the get go, it was um, very challenging because it was such a uh, short time frame. I remember it was about three months. So we were given the theme Forbidden Fruits and we basically had to come up with the story and curate the exhibition ourselves. We of course had to look at our um, famous tropical fruit that's so, um, so much part of our way of life in Malaysia, the spiky shell durian, the rambutan, the multiple seeds and flesh, the intense flavor that you see in passion fruit and so forth. Um, from day one, we brainstormed together. Uh, we basically talked about how basically almost like the limitations of the material that they could find because basically they had to go to the jungle to get these rattan, um, the skills that the artisans had and somehow we sort of gelled all these stories together and that helped us basically to um, be able to come up with these um, the, the objects. Now, then it was time for the um, wonderful people to go to the villages, some of them from very far away places in Sarawak to go to these sort of um, um, uh, communities and help them translate our ideas to them, our sketches. And some of them were very um, sort of, um, uh, thought like, why are we making these strange objects? They thought we we're making things wrong. Um, we couldn't have done all this without the help of Jackie and Rosemary and Adric and all the weavers, our wonderful team at IDC and our interns. Um, in a sense, we uh, were trying to sort of see like how far we could push the boundaries with basically um, these sort of very traditional ways. Um, the site we were given was basically these um, old workshops that was converted into an art center. And we were actually very familiar with this place because it was actually one of our um, restoration projects. Um, we basically did mock-ups of the way that we wanted to take the public through the space. We did lighting diagram studies. And we, we were lucky we had like so many interns to help us construct this place. In the end, it sort of became these sort of large surreal sort of like vignettes that were basically hanging in this dark space that we created. Um, and it told the life cycle of fruits in a way from um, seed to germination, from propagation to decay. And it sort of became like this still life painting in a way. Um, it was a very sort of like um, instinctive process. And in a way it sort of made us see how appreciate the skills of these artisans a lot more because we could see like how much they could push the boundary and push them out of their comfort zones to sort of weave these objects that they were so unfamiliar with and sort of pushing into that realm of art and into the unknown. And the festival started and it was really interesting to see how the public um, interacted with these objects, with the things that were tickling the tops of their heads. Children, you're just like in awe at these like uh, littered sort of objects. And I think it made people see like, oh, we could actually do something different. It made them see like these everyday objects in very new ways. Coincidentally, um, Forbidden Fruits occurred at the same time we worked on these two projects with the Surat Tourism Board and the Surat Convention Bureau. Um, basically both offices moving into this new building. Uh, it was actually an old shopping center that was built in the 60s that was converted into an office building. Um, it was a challenging site, low ceilings and lots of massive columns. So one of the questions that we asked ourselves is basically how could we best represent these institutions in ways, because these institutions represented the vanguard of promoting Sarawak sort of local culture and natural beauty of the world. How can we make their space um, different and stand out from other institutions um, in terms of their mood in space and corporate identity? Um, we took inspirations from the Iban Baskas tree, for example. So our method was basically to try to make it loud and proud, right? Um, so this reception backdrop, we used like timber blocks um, in a sort of pixelated fashion and staggered passion um, pattern and wrapped it around basically our reception counter. Um, this is the reception counter of the Sarawakian Tourism Board. We basically took uh, cues from the ethnic motifs found in sort of the weaving cultures and etched it into traditional brass into the concrete floors. And you could see them in the custom strip lighting along the floors. And all these public spaces are connected in this large communal corridor, which is uh, prevalent in traditional longhouses here. Um, it's always important for us to basically put a function, a purpose, a sense of purpose to our design elements, um, simply because I think in order to bring it relevance to today's times, we have to make it workable as well. Otherwise, it's just basically sort of very decorative things. Um, and a way we try to make local things seem like global as well. 
This is a reception that we did for the Swat Convention Bureau. A little bit of a story for this reception counter. We commissioned uh, a village called Bethong, their Iban community. The rattan mats were encased in behind glass and light, as if you would in a museum piece. Um, so that basically added another texture of meaning and local context. And these are the beautiful ladies who wove our beautiful rattan mats. We're so proud of them. Um, it really made us think like, um, because basically these local communities um, have such a tough time and every day their livelihood is threatened, um, especially during the time we had the lockdown. So I think in supporting our local community, it really helps us to basically um, almost, um, um, so like a whole culture doesn't disappear. Um, we studied like basket weavings, Iban basket weavings, which is eminent in basically um, the floors that we tattooed basically with pebble wash, the metal trays in the ceilings that basically were used to conceal cables and wires and pipes and all that other stuff. Um, to end basically design is that sort of like magical, irrational and sometimes logical process where we try to sort of negotiate our place in the world. And it's, you know, it helps us to connect with our surroundings, our culture, people and so forth. So sometimes inspiration, you can find it anywhere, it can be really simple, and it can be something really close by. Thank you. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Tina, for those wonderful images and a really lovely presentation. Uh, we're moving on now to Kuala Lumpur, where our next speaker is based. Huat Lin is the director of ZLG Design. Huat, are you ready over there? Can, can you unmute yourself, please, Huat? Hello? Hi, Huat, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. You can hear me now, right? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. So just uh, so that you can get ready, I'm just going to say a few things about you. So okay. Huat Lim is the director of ZLG Design based in Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia. He has, had a, he has a career in design spanning over 33 years. Huat has worked with the legends of the architectural world, Norman Foster, Zaha Hadid, and Ron Heron. He's currently writing on theoretical and philosophical, philosophical basis for the practice of architecture. And his present top presentation topic for today is called The Common Ground. So what, can you please take it away? Thank you, Alan. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Okay, The Common Ground, that's a little sketch that I did, uh, you know, in my COVID uh, pandemic break. So we all architects, like we, we're not getting enough work. So we, we, we end up drawing and doodling away. Common Ground, okay. So um, basically, I think we're all connected. Everybody, you know, all of us here on uh, Pecha Kucha, uh, I think that connectedness is uh, something that really inspires me uh, in, in all the work that I do with uh, Susanna, who you saw in the video earlier. Uh, this is our office. So basically, we try and bring in into our environment stuff that, you know, uh, endearing things, you know, uh, hobby horse, uh, Eames chairs, drawings, photographs of landscape designers, you know. Um, so the environment to me is very, very important because we want to be reminded that we're always connected to to the outside of our, our, our mind. Okay, uh, the living world. Basically, this comes out of Alexander's, uh, Christopher Alexander's writings. Basically, uh, we're very inspired to always uh, relate to our culture, whether it be a village, uh, whether it be a scene in Japan, whether it be plants. Uh, so drawing is a medium in which we, uh, we kind of relegate and we always reflect on architecture, but there's always that mirroring, you know, like, Inside, outside, nature, buildings. Uh, so the environment and the, the visioning, the visioning of a, uh, of our the context of how we uh, procure and create our our designs uh, is always uh, the backdrop or the framework for which we uh, we evolve uh, our design. Uh, the unfolding theory is actually uh, another one of uh, Christopher Alexander's uh, great writing. You know, and I think in in nature, uh, like our buildings, I think we unfold. You know, over the years, that LG had been uh, practicing for the last 33 years and there's nothing like what we do today that resembles anything we started out doing you know so we like that we like the fact that we are organic and you know we change our underwear we change you know we we, we evolve right so uh and like cities i think cities are also evolving uh there's a bright painting that i love uh, i use that quite a lot actually i might get someone's gonna stop me using that image just too often you know Bruegel's uh, painting about, you know, uh, about the village, 
Uh, infrastructure is something that we really like doing also. This is an image that, uh, that LG did for Kenyang's project in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. I, I think infrastructure is very interesting because it talks about air rights, it talks about water bodies, it talks about mobility and transport systems. You know, uh, so this is just a sketch that I did for, for Ken. Um, okay, over to Aurobindo, this guy, uh, spiritual man, you know, he envisioned that a city ought to be very, very uh, connected to the universe. They talk about unity, about oneness, and all that stuff, which really is interesting for me, because I think, you know, if anything, someone asks me, what is the LG about? I say, well, we are an ashram, you know, we believe in uh, certain principles in nature. And um, yeah, artifacts. So we look at small things as well. We take a lot of time and, and, and we spend a lot of energy, you know, crafting little things like logos, pictograms, uh, iconographic stuff. You know, that tree on the top left is actually uh, done by Victor Zeitler, my son, who draws a little kind of emblem for the house. So there's a lot of delight in looking at very, very, very small, small things. So cultural intelligence, everyone talks about culture, but to me, uh, Mark Piego pointed this out, you know, in his book. Uh, basically, every culture will have an imprint and we have different realities for how we see beauty. And, and the chair on the left, my sketch, is actually a three-legged thing from, uh, I think it was from Hanoi somewhere. And it's interesting that you see culture has an influence on how we perceive good design. Uh, uh, a doorknob uh, I found in, uh, in, uh, in the middle of France, somewhere in uh, Toulouse. If I can't remember, uh, it was somewhere in France. Amazing, uh, amazing design, I think, you know, and that's where cultural intelligence plays a very significant part of our, our thinking, our psyche in terms of uh, what drives uh, what drives the office, you know, who doesn't want to do beautiful buildings. So Emmanuel Khan talks about beauty and I, I'm surprised that anyone even like, you know, bothers to define uh, what beauty is. I think beauty, beauty is everywhere, you know. Yeah. So, but it's interesting. I found, I land on this guy Kant uh, when I was like 21, 22 at the AA trying to read into beauty. And I think uh, it brings you into this uh, other people, you know, other people like uh, Alan Watts, who, who taught me that, you know, uh, everything is relative, you know, uh, without the other person, you don't, you don't really know yourself. And, you know, the client actually defines what we do, actually, without a client, uh, we don't have a brief. So it's kind of like, interesting to reflect on this uh, Alan Watts uh, philosophy about uh, existence. Gordon Pass taught me at the AA, and he was one of those uh, med professors walking around with a whiskey in his hand all day long, you know, but he, 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 he kind of theorized that, you know, without a conversation, we won't get anywhere. So, you know, Pecha Kucha and all that forums that's going on, I think it's very important that we don't talk to machines alone. Uh, his theory is that without uh, talking to people, we can't create intelligence. Uh, Christopher Alexander uh, uh, wrote four books, which I think most people know, all of you would know this book, you know, nature, the, this, this book actually, Nature of Order, I think is the only thing that you really need to read. If, you know, for every student, I think you only need, ever need to read these four books. Uh, it's everything is in there, nature, connect, uh, you know, language and everything. Um, I know I'm throwing out all these books, right? But I think it's very important for architects to understand what goes on in other realms. Uh, Mark Pago is a linguist. Uh, he pointed out that, you know, in nature, there's a lot of uh, communication that's done through sounds, vibrations, language systems. And I, I think there's a book that I highly recommend uh, for architects. Uh, these two images, I, I like to put them side by side because it talks about education system, you know. Uh, million is like, there's a, there's a whole body of knowledge that, you know, manifests that city, right? It's amazing. And then you got that, you know, a guy that went to Harvard or whatever you went to, you know, education system produced scientists. All they want to do is like blast our heads off, you know. It's, so the education to me is, is a very important uh, part of uh, that LG's uh, psyche and, 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 and about creating life, you know. What's the point of putting up buildings that are, you know, desolate, uh, turn into ruins? So craft and, 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 and putting life into what we do is very important. So I think uh, the whole... The whole idea about running a, a practice is that you want to create life, you know. And and I, I put up uh, very remote people like Jerome Schuring, who is actually a, a mathematician. He's a programmer, and he says something very beautiful. He says that even if you had to write code, it has to look beautiful. And and you see, it's a living thing. Even code is a living thing. And I, I think that's very inspiring. That we don't see beauty just in architecture; it's everywhere. And I, I like to finish off by putting up this uh, amazing painting by Nida Montegreno that shows how the tree and us, we are connected, you know, uh, the trunk and then our thumbprint. 
Thank you very much. I think that's my last slide. All right. Wow. Cool. Very, very cool. Nothing, nothing from the studio, you know, like, you know, what are we up to? Nothing. We haven't got work, actually. Sorry, guys. <laughs> thank you so much, Fuad, for that very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Thank you, Evan. And thank you for reminding us that um, uh, we architects and designers, we're not just for designing nice, pretty things to put in magazines, but we're also part of that universal culture of thinking and, and, and philosophizing as well. So thank you so much for reminding us of that. Can we give quite another round of applause? Awesome. Well, moving on. We are going out from taking a short trip from Kuala Lumpur across the Shining Sea over to Indonesia, where we find our next speaker getting ready, Wendy Johara. Wendy, are you uh, ready? Yes. Wendy, already. can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you, Wendy. Nice to see you again. Um, so while you're getting ready, I'll just say a few words. So Wendy Johara or from uh, co-founder Johara and Johara in Jakarta, Indonesia in 2004, together with her husband, Ahmad Johara. Together, they received several awards for their works, including for the Sugihato Steel House, the Shining Stars Bintaro Kindergarten, and the Tana Tudua House. Johara and Johara have won several design competitions, including the Wayang Museum in Jakarta in 2004. And if that wasn't enough for uh, enough accomplishment for one individual, Wendy has also taught at Palita, Palita Harapan University since 2010. So uh, please give a warm welcome to Wendy Johara and Wendy, please take it away. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy, I'm based in Jakarta and I'm an architect. This is uh, some of the projects we've dealt with in Jakarta um, that we've had to uh, face a few issues. This is a project, uh, a collaborative project between 10 architects led by Andra Martin. It's located in a land that's quite green and lush and very beautiful um, that has lots of uh, fruit trees and uh, other rare trees, including the giant kapok tree there. My lot is actually right behind that um, giant kapok tree. It's very small, but uh, there's five existing trees there that couldn't be cut down. So I've had to design uh, around it. Um, we wanted to keep uh, most of the landscape and um, we didn't want to uh, do too much damage to it. So um, what we did was um, uh, we put the main living room on the top floor because it had um, the best view towards the park in front of it. And then to connect it all, uh, we put a green stretch of ramp uh, from the park to, 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 do, to the floor. And uh, underneath the main living area, it's, it's the service area, uh, where it's uh, quite accessible, but it's stuck, um, so you can't really see. And because uh, um, this land is surrounded by uh, urban kampongs, we didn't want to uh, make the house stand out, but we wanted to blend into the kampong. So that's why we made kind of like a modern kampong house that's um, divided by the trees. Um, the design guidelines of this project was uh, decided together by the 10 architects, including uh, the choice of local materials, like uh, these hollow bricks that we use throughout the whole projects. And um, as you can see uh, from the um, uh, photographs here in the living room, you could see the, the giant couple tree right in front of the house there. Uh, the choice here is that you could use uh, natural ventilation or uh, by AC, um, uh, if desired. Um, sorry. Um, uh, the next project I will be showing is uh, another house in, in Jakarta that's um, located in uh, Depok area. In Jakarta, most people usually live in their house, um, inside the house, and uh, they turn the AC on, so they don't really appreciate their, their gardens. Um, they only see it from inside the house or when they leave the house. This is a house uh, for a family of five. Um, one, uh, the father and one of the daughters actually has asthma. So they wanted a house that didn't rely too much or end on air conditioning, but they wanted uh, natural ventilation throughout the whole house. Um, the first floor occupies only like 50% uh, of the land. Um, so we could create a lot of uh, cross ventilations and uh, a lot of sunlight into the house. 
uh, the first floor is for the kitchen, living, and dining areas, and all the bedrooms are located on the top floor. To allow um, natural ventilations um, throughout the house, we used, uh, again, many hollow bricks and um, uh, glass louvers and a lot of uh, doors that could be opened um, all the way through. Uh, so that if you open all the doors uh, on the ground floor, you feel uh, as if there is no boundaries between the interior of the house and the exterior gardens. Um, the second floor uh, of the house is uh, slightly larger to create overhangs to protect it from the rain and sun. Uh, we placed a, a, book, a bookshelf right next to the staircase here so the, um, the owner of the house could uh, take the books as they go up or down the stairs and they could also sit here and uh, enjoy the breeze from the hall bricks uh, right next to it. This is a renovation project uh, for a kindergarten in Bintaro area in Jakarta. Um, it, actually, it started as a, a small project with a very limited budget. All they wanted to do is uh, add two classrooms and do a, a nice paint job and maybe fix some of the problems that they had. But at that time, Jakarta had a huge flood, uh, one of the big floods um, in Jakarta that um, crippled the whole city. So uh, what I intended was, um, I wanted to uh, make the building coverage shrink actually from 90% to 60%. So I tore down some of the uh, building masses on the ground floor and put it on the second floor. And then um, uh, what, uh, because of the budget was uh, very limited, we couldn't make a, a big school. What we tried to do was uh, to make the spaces more efficient. And then we had to use a uh, very um, cheap, local materials that are uh, readily available in um, the uh, stores. And then uh, to also use very lightweight structure. So the bottom uh, structure is uh, concrete and bricks, but the uh, upper structure uses a lot of uh, lightweight steel. Um, but how do you accommodate all the uh, functions and um, activities that they needed? So um, what we had to do was uh, do a lot of multifunctional uh, spaces. Like um, on the uh, left photograph, if you open up all those sliding doors, you could connect two classrooms into one big space and make it into makeshift gym or uh, other um, functions that they need. And then um, also one room can also be divided with uh, furniture to create smaller spaces uh, uh, if they need it. The ground floor, if you open all the, the um, doors, you could get one uh, extra large space where the kids could set up a stage in the middle courtyard and then uh, do performances while their families and friends could watch from all the surrounding spaces. The building's materials here are, are just um, very cheap, um, regular and uh, uneven like uh, the bricks here. Um, so what we've had to do is uh, we had to create a, a pattern that was that would suit uh, the, the unevenness of, of the materials. Even the um, local uh, cheap tiles are uh, cut into a special pattern. So a few years ago, I had the opportunity to meet uh, the headmaster of the Fuji Kindergarten in, in Japan. And when we asked, um, why are there still um, sharp corners and dangerous spaces in, in your school? He answered that the Adults can't always um, take care of the, the kids 24-7, uh, so the kids have to fend for themselves. They are um, taught to protect themselves and um, react to what they face in, from the outside world. So I think in this um, uh, global pandemic, I think we have to learn from the kids uh, how to face uh, the challenges um, that we are about to face and um, start to learn from them. I think that's it. Thank you. Wow, thank wow. you, Lindy. Amazing. That's one place I want to be in lockdown, you know, with, uh, yeah. with all that great cross ventilation and a beautiful brickwork. Really, really well done. Um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of people have learned that uh, lockdown in, uh, in, uh, in houses without ventilation makes you even sicker, you know, and not, not only physically, but also mentally. Uh, so, 
congratulations, beautiful projects. Thank you so much, Wendy, for sharing the thoughtful work that Johar and Johar have been doing in Jakarta. So please, let's give Wendy another round of applause. <laughs> well done. Well, we're moving on today. Well, our airlines and our airplanes might be grounded for now because of COVID-19, but thanks to Pachakcha, we can travel in our mind's eye, and this time we're crossing the sea again over to Singapore uh, to visit Francis Go of FDAT. Uh, Francis, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Good, yeah. good to hear from you. Well, yeah. Francis is someone that I've known for quite some time, uh, born in Kuching. Francis co-founded FDAT, an exciting Singapore-based architectural practice in 2013 with Donovan Soon. Both of them are alumni of the acclaimed Singapore architectural firm, Warha. Francis believes good design is for everyone and is focused not only in crafting fine details, but also on innovative green and socially conscious design. So Francis, the floor is yours. Right, okay. Okay, thank you for the opportunities. Um, there is such our office, I'm actually in the office right now. Um, it's been seven years when I count today, just to go to count. Seven years, I thought we we're going to have a small office like this, uh, six to eight person, but I think it grew it to, to 20 over plus at the moment. And uh, there's a first office, the first office that we have, the screen. And uh, we actually talk light, like the details and uh, how we use materials, a soft, create a hard material to a soft material, like the left hand side of the metal. And then we actually wrap around the screen with a, to like become a skin to a specialist, specialist. and uh, we also looking at how to make you get relate to a pinan screen to make it like a pinan. And that's uh, some of the project they actually work around and they fly a lot, a lot. As a uh, Singapore, you know that we're going to fly to everywhere and get that's a project that we are working on. And uh, actually, when we started off our office, nobody trusts us locally, and uh, Emma, we actually tried to got a lot of foreign. Uh, clients to work with and uh, that is the first project that we got before uh, we, we, we execute. It's actually located as the Singapore River uh, where the washing board is a kind of uh, insertion like a new and the old design and I'm going to bring you through the slide that uh, how we enter to this hotel, how we actually emphasize and keep the original because with the lower budget that we uh, go to manage so we enter to the side where um, to the entrance and uh, we preserve the existing wall where it, the original staircase is located. And uh, once you're going in through the staircase, the lobby actually revealed in only, only two meters, but we use a mirror, expand it up, become four meters in a way that you can see from the screen uh, when you're going through. And uh, right now we're doing the Japanese hotel uh, restaurants and upper floor are kind of, um, you can see very clearly the, the box, where the metal box and uh, the, uh, the old architectures is merged together and where the expressions of it. And it's kind of a small room, but still pleasant to live in. And uh, we also keeping all the existing structures uh, when we both build the buildings. We bring in the green and the courtyard can bring in the water, just like the old short house that we try to keep. And above the upper floor, you can see the screen and it start to become new. That is actually the open area that we have. And another job that quite representing our look is actually a local competition we did. It's an urban area that we would like to enjoy by everyone. It's not only just a building, but I think it's a kind of a difference we want to achieve. A little bit of result and differences for the people. And start off with a lot of competition. This is a competition with the Chinese developers that we insert actually like a, a series of planter box along a short house area in Wan Chai in Hong Kong. And so similar language have been, been bring in to the lobbies, to the interiors. And then we actually uh, build a house that have a similar language. In KL, uh, Bukit Mintan, uh, this area is kind of the, the, old shop, uh, the, the, the offices that rent a lot renter. And uh, in, in that area, we actually put in a, uh, converting an office to be a hotel when all the room can actually have a planters and screen off the busy street. And uh, back to the overseas, similar concept that we actually do before in Guangzhou. And uh, the, this client is in Beijing, by the way. Um, he, he actually owns this area, actually have the hot spring that uh, generate a hot uh, uh, 
or a, a spa that they actually running a business would like to bring introducing like a greenery into it. And this concept is still continue. And uh, we finally, the Singapore clients that after the fifth year of practice, they're looking at us as a potential uh, designer and start to roll in more projects for us. And this is actually at Marina. It's an all retrofitting uh, hotel that will bring in the greeneries into the space where the bird nests and the greenery merge together. I think in Singapore, the practice are kind of um, a lot of rules. Uh, and uh, we actually quite, uh, when we're beginning as architects, in fact, nobody comes to us, we take a challenging site, how to uh, challenging the site that nobody wants to do. Actually, we try to force uh, the local authority to convert a certain part of the site, especially this is meant to be an apartment site and how we deal with using a design merit um, to convey the message to help them to convert into a more valuable land, like a um, hotel, for example. And uh, in fact, we, we, as, as what we say, that detailing that we actually try to more inherit a Saudi Asia way of detailing. And another actually few more projects that we are working on is, is after the Little India riots, I think there's a buildability issue that we see whether using a modular system to build a construct a buildings. It's something that we are uh, experimenting and that is the size of container with the length and uh, experimenting the size is still viable. It's something that we're actually working uh, with the developers, how to actually constructing this in a cheaper country like China, Vietnam, and build some cast in situ uh, uh, rooms and then deliver it by ship and all the way shipping to the site and build a building out of it. Currently, we're doing it as a uh, few experimental uh, buildings. Um, there is one in the Australia. I think inside there, there's a space of running through a different tier of waters. And this is in the Queenstown, New Zealand. Um, some sort of, uh, we try to borrow the local indigenous uh, patterns to do the facade, a side view towards the lake. And the back to KL, in fact, there's a client approaching us to do something that a tall tower, which I refuse. I said, that, uh, I think that I, I don't want to do, to do such a tall towers. And uh, I, I, the more he push it to me, I creating a multiple ground and uh, creating kind of cross ventilations complex in the mid uh, Gentings area where cross ventilations happening through at the different uh, aspect. And uh, it's a multiple a tier of ground looks like um, mixed developments, but we actually clearly define that the land with the, this is a drop off area, area and the retail have a C shape that looking towards a, the nice, um, uh, views. Um, that's an open piazza. There's no air conditioner. We just keep it as an open through and uh, create another ground at the podium level, creating multiple tier, creating the privacy and uh, above the ground that we actually analyze the wind flow, how we're going to get create the wind flow and the residential facing to the east and the south side, um, avoiding the sun. And uh, that's the last slide that I have. And then we found, actually we grow up to like 20 over people right now without them. I don't think that we can be today, but I think we'll still continue and pushing the boundary what we can do. Thank you so much. I think I apologize that I think there's a lot of DG file that we by the team. I'm not sure, I think the spirit of uh, Fikakusha, a uh, little damage, but hopefully it's a pre, there's a many more projects we can share, but it's a preview of what we do right now. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Francis, for sharing the exciting work of FDAT in Singapore. Uh, yeah, those of you who might have been keeping time would have noticed that that was, that's appeared to be more than 20 slides. But uh, as Francis explained, he was using GIFs. So some yeah, of those yeah, uh, multiple all, images, all they were 20 that. slides, but <laughs> those slides, some of those slides were multiple images that changed very quickly. So pushing the boundaries a little bit, but that seems to be the way that uh, FDAT is, uh, has chosen to work in architecture as well. So thank you very much, Francis. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we're going back to Kuala Lumpur this time, and this time we are meeting up with Amy Liang from Studio Coco Kachang. Uh, Amy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, uh, nice to uh, welcome to the welcome to Pecha Kacha, Amy. So Amy is a designer who runs a solo studio, Studio Coco Kachang. Amy graduated from the One Academy in Malaysia and trained with JDW Design Workshop. Amy believes that design is a multi-tool discipline and is constantly exploring the limits of using humble everyday materials and creating ambiguous relationships between objects and their users. And her presentation topic today 
is some small thoughts on my projects. So take it away, Amy. Hi, I'm Amy. Um, I'm going to share some small thoughts in a few of my projects. This is a portable lead printing workshop project. While my first meeting with the clients, with the team, I found most of them are girls. It's quite difficult for them to carry the things around as the printing material is very heavy. So I was thinking maybe I can design something that can be overweight. The client has an old lead uh, printing company in after the time, and now it has become a living museum. This is their original lead library in their composing room. The original air stands for the lead tray are long and heavy. It's not suitable for the portable workshop. So uh, from there, by inspiring by the conventional ladder like the one on the right top, I tried to change the original air stand to become a foldable air stand. So it's easier and lighter to carry. And although it's a shorter now, but we can still join them as a group by putting them side by side. Now, about the furniture that comes with the roller wheel. Uh, so in the next slide, the item one is a display table with the glass top, so people can view the display like jewelry shopping. And then item two is the toolbox that comes with a cover as a table. Item three is a storage and roller stool at the same time. Now with these uh, roller furniture, each girl can easily carry two tables at the same time. The workshop is located inside the client's printing warehouse in Kuala Lumpur. The picture on the right was taken right after the completion of the project. And immediately, the team had took some of the furniture out to set up for an event during the Malaysia Independence Day. The picture on the right is the first, very first event uh, workshop. So, and all the depth of the tables are the same. So the tables can be joined together to become a long linear counter. Or just like a puzzle, the team can always join or separate them in order to fit into different skill uh, of such or uh, events. There are 10 examples that I share with the team. They can start the counter from working table, display table, and endless possibility based on their needs. This is a project to remodel a former printing finishing warehouse to a FMP terrace. During the meeting with the client, we understand that they are applying funding for to do a community pocket park in their compound. To manage the building and the pocket park, we use the stand aggregate in the garden to make the building wall. On plan, we have divided the unit into various sizes and given a cut to the existing rectangular box like building. With this simple cut, the building has created more corner units and a freestanding unit which ample access to view and natural light. Between the lot S and lot M, we have inserted a green belt garden to connect to the pocket park. This is the green belt garden that created by the simple cut. We have a magnetic tea house that you can pre-book for family gathering or company meeting and just order the food from the restaurant around. The multi-purpose corner is a semi uh, outdoor dining area or allow for live there in the garden. The strength of the space is about the path and the history. We try to remain the original structure and existing elements as much as we could. The roof and the trusses, the existing machinery, and even the old paint on the floor. Instead of demolishing, we choose to marry the past and present and man-made and natural. This is the lot M. The unit of the beauty, oh, the, the beauty and the beauty part, beautiful part of this project was uh, it involved two clients concurrently. A Melbourne neighborhood prepared in 2012 and the printing company that established in 1952. We think to let the surrounding and present activity to define the character would be the best. Every unit here got at least two facades. And for the lock end, we have four facades. Facade one is the garden wall that facing the main road. Facade two is the restaurant uh, men's entrance. Facade three is uh, facing the internal compound and event space, and the facade four has a big communication window that very close to the compound entrance. The picture was taken before the restaurant launch, but because there was a food bazaar then so people start to use the area. Sometimes I feel that it's very touching when we found that the design can speak itself and connect to the people, and people now know how to use it without being explained to them. 
This is an 800 square feet restaurant in the mall. Red color is the back of house that requested by the client. So we left about 400 square feet for our customer to dine in. The layout on the left is the conventional layout with standard dining furniture. It could get about 24 feet. We suggested the client to consider on our proposal. It could get about 41 feet. This is how the seating looks like in our proposal. Instead of those conventional dining chairs, we introduced a big two-sided seating bench to this project. This bench helps to control and cut down the unnecessary spacing in between the dining furniture. Uh, it makes but triageable, so it's heavy and stable to minimize the movement of the seating. Uh, so it won't disturb the people who are sitting at the, the other side. Beside the triageable furniture, we have timber bench and table here also. Uh, this is because the timber furniture is much more lighter, so we can move them around for a purpose. Instead of one big bench, the timber bench has divided by two. It's because sometimes you just need to move half of them. So in the picture one, it shows the original layout with a row of timber bench and table on the left. In the picture two, we move and join the table for a bigger group. In the picture three, as the spacing between the trouser sitting is the same as the length of the timber furniture. So we can join it in a row to become a communal table for a much more bigger group. Uh, this is a chair designed for a competition. It's a chair designed as a live company uh, which is able to respond to different stages as we go. So it means more to us. The chair blur the boundary between the children chair and adult chair. And what we need to do is just to rotate it. It creates a harmony relationship between the user and client. So this is a chair trying to avoid any unnecessary details but the honest function as a chair. We have only two materials here, the rubber wood and the bamboo weaving. The entire frame of this chair is in the same profile. And the rattan, a lightweight and flexible material. And I feel that the weaving craftsmanship itself already is a piece of hard work. This, uh, and then the mock out, I hope, uh, I hope this can help to improve the throwaway culture. Is uh, my life my chair, or we can also pass it down to the next generation as an object with sentimental value, like a uh, great grandma wedding chair. Uh, that's all my sharing today. Those are the chair, my thoughts and design are. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Such thoughtful projects. Uh, it's lovely, kind of, to looking at uh, at it in 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 so close up, and uh, it makes it even more lovely because of that. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Thank, you so much, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you so much, Amy. For, for that wonderful uh, presentation. And thank you for showing us that uh, uh, big impact can come from small designs. And thank you so much. And everybody, please give up another round of applause for Amy. Well done, thank you. Well done, well done. Well done. Speaking of small projects, we're going to stay, stay a while longer in Kuala Lumpur and our next speaker is Kevin Lowe. Uh, Kevin, are you ready? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you so much, Kevin. Well, Kevin Lowe uh, is a director of small projects based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It's called Small Projects, but has had, his uh, firm has had a massive impact in the architecture uh, in, in Malaysia. Kevin is an architect by training and lives in the monsoon tropics of Peninsula, Malaysia. His work concerns the design of the built environment, teaching and writing when time permits. So Kevin, please take it away. Thanks a lot, Alan. Usually at events like this, I, I, for the last four years at least, I just talk about critical issues, but you can imagine it being difficult to fit critical issues into six minutes, 40 seconds. So I hope you don't mind Astrid if I do a bit of Kundalini yoga on your present on, on the Pecha Kucha format and so, but, Unlike Francis, I'm not going to jam 100 slides in the same amount of time. Legally, I'm not going to be thrown in Pecha Kucha jail. I'm just going to throw three, show three slides, but uh, the first slide for six times and the next two slides for seven times each. Yeah, And we're showing three projects. The first, uh, the first is a house I did for myself, the first project I've designed for myself in 20 years. And all the three projects, and the second one is a big building, and the last one is a small project. And they are all tied together by uh, ventilation and cross ventilation being the gold standard. This house is divided into two. And, um, and basically the top part is one side of the house, which is a two story volume with a, a bedroom in the middle. And the wind blows right through it, through these window openings. And all of them have louvers as well. So the, they are fully adjustable, the doors are below as well. 
and uh, the the, door, the the windows at the back uh, are fixed open louvers, and right to the front you can see the thing. On the other side of the house, it's fronted by a kitchen, breezes right through a study, right through a bicycle workshop, and then through the uh, bathroom at the back. And depending on which openings you close, this one. Or and, and, and that one, the wind blows through the opposite sides of the house. So, you know, natural ventilation, not the provision of, or the lack of provision of which being illegal by, by law and uninhabitable by fact, we should really be talking about cross ventilation because that's the gold standard, yeah? And so what these projects have in common is that whole act of moving air and, and the details associated with thereof. Um, the details, of course, you know, have everything to also do with the operability of of how the louvers work. You, I don't sure you can see this door right here. That's a whole length of, of operable louvers. So the doors are where we usually fail because if you shut a door, you don't have ventilation if you want a privacy. And the whole idea of having louvers built into the door is so that you have a modicum of screening without losing uh, uh, um, uh, ventilation and, and privacy in, in that act. And a lot of buildings which claim to be well ventilated really aren't because you, know, you can't have privacy or screening and ventilation at the same time. So the details, I believe, is where the difference is made. And this house I did for myself is one, one of those things. You can come and stay in my guest room if you visit Malaysia at some point in time, and, um, and I can cook a meal for you, perhaps. And so this is the beauty of really knocking down, you know, one single slide into six times, because you can really begin to relax and talk about and ramble on about stuff which has nothing to do with the presentation. Now waiting for the second project, which is a big building in Bangkok. The, the same rule applies, but except that in this case, I've got a big front garden for each unit. I've got a back garden for each unit. I've got a house sitting in between, which is two stories high. So the same principle applies that by dividing, uh, by putting a house in the middle of a, of a garden, you can close off openings and open other openings. And because of the, the, the uh, um, pressure differential, you can bring all the amount of wind right through the entire house and it's not been done before in a high rise. This whole act of cross ventilating every single room, including the maid's toilet and the storeroom. And um, the only places which are finished in this building are the top level where you've got the uh, facilities for uh, all the residents as a community and the ground floor, which is, uh, which is of course the living room for the entire project and all the services in between, all that's finished. And the units are left as bare shells for each individual buyer to decorate their own way in whatever way they want. That way, satisfying people willing to spend up to five million US dollars per unit. Each unit here is between 4,500 square feet to 6,000 square, 500, 5,500 square feet. And I, I was also responsible for doing two show units. Over here, you see one end of the front garden, the other end of the front garden, and then the back garden over here, which the bedrooms look out into as well, so you get cross airflow in between. The, the client, uh, oh yeah, of course, the, um, by taking out the top floor for, for you know, entertainment and, and, and guest use, you, you, relieve, you reduce the amount of space given over to servicemen for actually cleaning or you know, maintaining buildings. So I created this, um, this thing a level below, uh, uh, kind of balconies for servicemen to hang out and they also get all that cross ventilation <laughs> that they need uh, as uh, valuable members of society, yeah? Let's not just design for the bloody rich. Um, what else can I say about this? The building was all, all, all aligned to the main primarily, uh, primary uh, seasonal winds from east, northeast, to uh, west, southwest. So all the openings uh, uh, really make, maximum use of that pressure differential for the act of cross ventilation. Um, the, the project's called the wind shell, but if you sp separate the word, instead of wind shell, you put winds hell, it's exactly what it becomes during the really bad times of the year. And, and, and yeah, we've actually gotten very concerned about the openings. It's, it's holding up pretty well right now, but you know, it's as an experiment, who knows what's gonna happen in the next year. The last project is for a chapel in Barrio. Uh, an event happened there uh, 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 close to 40 years ago and they wanted to do a chapel to commemorate this event. And up in the highlands at, at about, you know, um, 2,500 meters, there's very little heat. Uh, so the wind is very cool. And for the chapel, they, they wanted something that would, uh, that would not need to be enclosed. And the most common building material up in Barrio is the 10 millimeter rebar because all floor slabs get made out of that. 
So it doesn't matter how much wood you want to use, that actually takes more effort. So I just made the whole damn thing out of 10 millimeter rebars that the chapel is actually designed on, on two ground beams. One's a square and one's a circle inscribed in that square. And all the rebars are just located within those two ground beams. And the circle provides lateral rigidity for the, for the outer rebars. And then there are some minor, minor apses, smaller chapels in the space that's created in between for, for breakup groups. So it fits up to 36 people and five people in the small apse chapels. And the whole thing kind of moves, of course, not with the wind, but when you lean on it, because it's just a uh, uh, 10 millimeter rebars, but it doesn't fall down. And the whole act of allowing wind to blow right through extends also to the cross that I designed for it. It sits on a, on a, on a single point in the ground and it, it kind of moves a little in the wind and hopefully it's not going to fail. Um, and, and the wind chime also you see over here is just a, basically a brass uh, rod that has got a little clangor in the middle and when the wind blows, it's like a sound of distant church bells, which is, I felt was kind of appropriate since this belonged to Christians, not to Catholics, you know, the dirty side of Christianity. Sorry for those who are Catholic, I didn't mean that. Um, and that's basically it. Thank you very much. I finish ahead of time and I hope you guys enjoyed my 20 slides because that's exactly what I did. Six times one, seven times one, and seven times one. So I did, you can't throw me in Pecha Kucha jail, yeah? No, you're going to jail, Kevin. Kevin, we know you like to be a rebel and we love you for that. Uh, and uh, you actually used the format in a very clever way. So well done. But I that. just want you to know you're not the first one to do this. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> Back in the day, there was a person who was collecting Rita Mitsuko LPs. Okay, you know the LP cover? Yes. And uh, she, th this person was collecting them from different countries. And so every slide was the photograph of the LP, the same LP cover of Rita Mitsuko from a different country. So 20 slides, okay. all the same, okay? <laughs> Except yes. different language, so okay. uh, it was uh, it was fantastic. So, anyways, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, thank it, you. Uh, I'm jealous. Thank you so of much, Kevin. You. Please let's give a, uh, a big thank you to Kevin for his yeah, presentation. Thank you. Very inspiring. Thank you so much, Kevin. Well, from uh, Kuala Lumpur, we're returning back here to Kuching, and uh, well, we architects and designers we often talk about. Uh, uh, often about uh, about learning from local vernacular traditions and heritage, and but there are some people among us whose uh, sole mission is to preserve those uh, those uh, those fast disappearing uh, heritage and culture. And uh, this brings us to Lisa Sideni of the Brook Gallery, Kuching. Uh, Lisa, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, yeah. Lisa. Welcome. <laughs> to Hi. Well, Lisa is currently on a mission to revive long lost Malaysian traditions and heritage, and also to document them for the benefit of future generations. This educated turned museum manager is passionate about Sarawak's heritage and culture and believes that our priceless traditions are worth preserving. Lisa firmly believes that education is the best way to empower women and girls to make that big difference in life. And her presentation topic is exploring the past to inspire the future. Lisa, the floor is yours. All right, um, thank you, Alan. All right. Okay, um, salam alaikum and um, good Evening, everyone. My name is um, Lisa Sidini, Museums Manager from uh, Brook Museums um, Kuching, Sarawak. Now, I don't have any design slides to, to share with you, being the only non designer, non architect uh, in today's presentation, but I'm truly honored uh, to be here today sharing some information about Brook Museums and um, our endeavors in um, conserving, preserving, and um, sustaining Sarawak's heritage, history, and culture for the future generation. Now, uh, these endeavors of us uh, bring me to my topic today, as um, Alan had mentioned, exploring the past uh, to inspire the future. And for those of you who haven't heard about us, uh, Brook Museum since only four years old this year, right? We are still very young, but somehow, like, you know, I believe that never deters us from dreaming and achieving big. And um, with a humble beginning in September 2016, when we first launched the Brook Gallery at Fort Margarita, uh, personally and honestly, I, I never would have thought our young team led by our director, Mr. Jason Brook, the sixth generation of the um, Brook family, would be able to have our second museum, the Rani Museum, launched in just um, two years, all right? And um, so what we have here next would be in 2016, we brave, sorry, 2019, we brave ourselves again with a teaser opening of um, 
the Museum of Kuching during the Rainforest Fringe Festival, our trial of a potential third museum. And um, at the time, we we're super blessed as the temporary exhibition was so well received by the community that we are now working our best for the opening of our third museum, um, God's Willing, sometime in 2021, it's 2022. And I recall our director reflecting on uh, Brook Trust's vision from being a small UK charity with limited resources to a charity now opening, sorry, operating uh, two museums in Sarawak. And this would not have been possible without the generosity of a growing community of um, supporters, uh, sponsors and volunteers alike who share our vision of uh, transforming a unique historical legacy into socially responsible outcomes for communities in Sarawak and around the world. So you would have seen that um, our mission and vision would actually be to inform, enrich and inspire. So those are core um, of what we truly stand for and what we believe the curation of our exhibition will be able to make that significant impact, especially for the uh, young generations of um, Sarawak. And uh, something that the um, new generations would actually have immense pride in. Now, what you could see here would actually be our beautiful Fort Margareta, and she's going to be um, 140 years old next week, 3rd of July. And the fort now houses our first museum, the Brook Gallery. Which, and um, so the fort was built by the second Raja, Sir Charles Brook, in 1879. And the design of this iconic landmark is based on an English castle. And um, so the fort restoration was a process of discovery during which the original building and changes that had been made to it over the past century were revealed. So Fort Margarita was also one of the few forts in the state to be built of bricks, whereas the rest were actually mostly constructed of um, balian or the iron wood. And as well as the restoration of historic building, the project has been used to raise public awareness of the need to conserve Sarawak's built heritage. So the reopening of this restored uh, fort and its new permanent exhibition, the Brick Gallery, took place on 24th September 2016, which coincided with the 175th anniversary of the founding of uh, the state of um, Sarawak, right? So you would be able to see now, like, you know, a um, beautiful view. So what we have here would be um, the Brick Gallery. So the Brick Gallery, our first museum, uh, tells the story of um, one of the most remarkable kingdoms in history, Sarawak and its white Raja. And our displays focus on the people, places, and events that have shaped the state. So these would be, um, yeah, you would be able to see um, our first Raja, James Brook, all right? And um, some of the displays that we've got here, all right, on our level one and um, uh, by the lobby of um, Fort Margarita, right? So, all right. Now, um, next what we have would be the Old Court House, all right? in which the exhibition Rani Margaret of um, Sarawak is house, right? And um, the Old Court House was actually built in 1874. Yeah, so this one, right? And um, this was built in keeping with his philosophy where the second Raja, Charles Brooke, wished to bring together under one roof all the departments of his uh, government, right? So, uh, um, and um, I'm actually, you know, broadcasting from, uh, you know, from the Rani Museum, right, at the moment, okay, and our Rani, Margaret of uh, Sarawak Exhibition, okay, this one, explores the extraordinary life, legends, and legacy of Margaret de Wint, who at age of 19 married the second Raja of Sarawak, and embraced a new life as the queen of uh, this remarkable kingdom, a role she fulfilled for almost half a century, okay, and um, thanks to her appreciation of um, local skills, such as um, weaving of songket, as well as embroidering karinkam, or golden veil, the finest examples of um, the Rani's uh, personal collection, mostly more than 140 years old, can now be shared. Okay? And um, another next would be um, a key part of the trust philosophy is to benefit communities through education experiences that promote uh, personal enrichment and community well-being. So in a short span of uh, 10 years since its inception, the trust has uh, continued to grow its vision to in, uh, of informing, enriching, and inspiring through um, various projects, right? And uh, using our museum as a platform for learning. As you could see here, we now support a bursary at the uh, Swinburne University in Sarawak for the uh, MA TESOL program. And uh, with the requirement that the successful applicants undertake uh, their internships at a Brook Museum. So what we have next here will be the internship program, right? And uh, that provides opportunities for uh, university students to gain experience in uh, museum operations, as well as um, management, special projects on exhibition design, including curatorship. 
right? And uh, next what we have will be emulating best practices from world's top museum. Our museum education program is carefully designed to engage interactively with the students at various levels of their education. And it's not so much about informing them about their history of Sarawak, but more about appreciating uh, the history in itself and learning how to interpret and develop individual critical thinking. And um, besides that, we also keep ourselves busy with various other community engagements like participating in local international festivals, like uh, what about Kuching, all right? And, uh, and uh, we also have, you know, through all these collaborations, uh, led us to having our own homegrown uh, Brook Blend uh, coffee, right? Because not many people are aware that the second Raja, uh, Charles Brook brought the first coffee to Sarawak in 1866 and established the earliest known coffee plantation in Malaysia. And through this uh, discovery, the Earthling Coffee Workshop, uh, the first specialty coffee in Sarawak, invited Jason Brook to actually craft a special Brook Blend with um, coffee beans uh, planted in Sarawak. So next time you guys are here, do let me know so that we can actually hang out and... Um, have uh, you know, our special book of coffee, right? And as we could see here, right? So this is actually my last slide. We are basically celebrating this, right? Uh, as long as we breathe, we hope, and we hope that uh, we're gonna have, uh, you know, um, uh, be able to have that privilege to preserve, conserve our um, heritage, right? Yeah, so that's it, thank you. Wow. Thank you, thank you very Thanks. much. Wow, fascinating. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing with us the crucial work of the uh, Brook Museums. I remember that those buildings here in Kuching, the, uh, the old courthouse and Fort Margarita, the decision to conserve them was made a long time ago but, uh, by the state government, but the government also really, really struggled to find sufficient uses to fill these big sort of spaces mm -hmm. and to find uh, uh, a contemporary use for these buildings. And the work that the Brook Museums that, that do is, is, is so crucial to keeping these um, buildings alive for future generations. So thank you so much, Lisa. Yes. Let's give thank Lisa you. another round of applause. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. And making, just before we finish, we are making a short trip back to Kuala Lumpur where our friend Inch Limp of Inchscape is waiting with bated breath to present. Well, Inch Lim, we've known him for quite a while. He frequently describes himself as a simple gardener, but the truth is his extensive tropical plant knowledge, innovative ideas, and intuitive understanding of space relations have made him a highly sought after landscape designer throughout the whole of Southeast Asia. By being responsible to wild environment and ecology, Inch selects only sustainable materials and enjoys native selections that reintroduce fauna to once lost habitats. So Inch, uh, I think you are ready, so let's take it away. Right, thank you, Alan, thank you. Right, okay, Michael Looney, the cartoonist, uh, is Australian and I think you all ought to look at this cartoon. This cartoon appeals to me. It's a man running after his own head and naked. So you're, you're naked, you're running with a net after your own head. And this is what I feel when I'm designing, trying to pin down that imagination and put flesh to it materialize it so that we can all experience it. So here we are, we have uh, some images of what I'm trying to do, trying to pin down the imagination and trying to, uh, to, 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 to experience it. There's one of a picture of a woman walking on water, there's plants coming out of the water, there's you know, circles after circles. The one that I particularly like on this image is the crocodile. This crocodile is a life-size size crocodile that we made out of bamboo and I love it. And I wish I could keep it. I made it for the uh, Tomasi Holdings, which is, a, I, I suppose, a kind of a government body, but I love the crocodile. Unfortunately, they want to keep it, so I've lost it. This is, these are the other kinds of jobs we do. The one on the right, I'm, we are trying to produce a moss garden in a circle at the end uh, of, a, of, of a complex, a series of complex spaces where you finally arrive at this, uh, this place. This uh, thing uh, is named Wild and Restless. It was uh, created in Singapore for a local gardening festival and uh, what I'm doing is using curves you can see interwoven curves of bamboo poles with uh, with walkways and water features but that's tempered by the very straight vertical erection of these vertical bamboos here we are building it uh, I want to show you I want to talk to you bring you to that top left hand 
corner, we, I have a picture of us making a lighting, light fixture. Sometimes light fixtures that are commercially available don't actually work. So we are doing this. And then there's another light fixture you can see in the middle bottom picture where we made that light fixture and we hung it on the pergola. This is the hardscape. So the hard landscape is all about woven pieces of bamboo so you can walk on it. This is quite common in Southeast Asia. Oh, well, in certain countries of Southeast Asia. And uh, then this is a softscape. I called it Wild and Restless because these plants come from Africa and South America, uh, originally brought by the colonial masters. And they have spread so prolifically that we don't actually notice how beautiful they are. I see them all the way up in Laos. I see them all the way to, to Southern China. And here I am putting them all together uh, to, to, to actually uh, highlight them so people can pay attention. So this is a finished picture. You will see you know, the, that, that drama against uh, the, the, the sky, night sky, and the plant is dramatically highlighted against the, uh, the bamboo um, thing. This is a project uh, which I call the basket case. It's a basket case because I've decided that, you know, why can't we make a building out of basket? And, we're building this whole, actually is inhabitable house out of basket, woven basket. You look at that, you see that there are light coming up from the top. It, you have ventilation going on both sides. And we, we had a very, very, very light carcass built. And then we wove the basket around the outside. Then we wove the inside of the basket. And then we roofed it with bamboo and floored it with bamboo and have all these fenestration that, that you can open to allow air to go in. This is the finished product. The, the, we have a ladder going up from the belly of the beast uh, and, uh, and it floats above the ground uh, next to a durian tree. The durian tree being uh, not really, we, we wanted to keep the durian tree. We didn't want to destroy the durian tree. So this is the final product. Nothing is straight, everything is woven, everything has a flow to it. And you see the doors are circular, the, 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 the light wells are, are circular. I, I just want to make it soft and, uh, and, and with, with no angles and no uh, thing. This, this is, a, we built this thing in China in Wuhan before the COVID virus, I must hasten to add. Actually, it was just built just before the COVID, uh, uh, COVID thing. And I call this Sinke because Sinke is a name for new immigrants to, to Malaya during, the, during uh, about a century ago. And people would come to Malaya from China and work as the indenture laborers. So what I wanted to do is, is narrate the, the whole process of being at home, going out to work, and then living in the, the Far East, really far away from home. This was built to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Chinese state. And it was also built for the Olympic, the, the Army Olympic that uh, took place in Wuhan last year. So you can see the, the very Chinese imagery. There's, there's the cage, which, which it depicts uh, really a chicken cage. You know, you're, you're really in a bridge going across the waters. Uh, and, looking out to that. So this is the end. The soft cape is very much a tropical mix, sort of in a way like uh, like what we get in, in, in a sort of English setting, except this is all using tropical plants, mostly from Southeast Asia. The left red thing is, a, is, is really a sugar cane. It's a red saccharide. This last project I'm going to show you is a playground. We decided to build this playground. We asked to build this playground in a, in a condominium. And uh, we, we wanted to make uh, places where children can play, they can crawl, they can climb, they can jump, they can swim, uh, and they can swing. So this is the way we're, we're building this at this moment. It is currently uh, being, uh, being built and this, this is a huge zeppelin hanging in the air that you can climb up to and then you can come down and you can sort of jump into the water and, and enjoy yourself. Uh, and there are little tunnels that you can crawl through, big spaces, small spaces. This is my final 
uh, slide. It is uh, a garden that we built in Kuala Lumpur. Um, the, the clients are very happy. We, there was a lot of problems convincing them to do this, but finally they agreed to it and we built this and we're very happy with this. So I'm going to stop speaking and you can enjoy the screen. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Oh, wow, so fantastic. Uh, how can you, I mean, you have all these beautiful weavers uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Malaysia. And of course, who can live without plants? And who, <laughs> who doesn't like plants? You know, we can't get enough of them. So, uh, wow, well done. Well done. Uh, kind of especially the nest house. What is it? Is it a hotel now? Or no, it, no. It, it, was it? Created, it was created as a playhouse with, uh, for the children of the house. But what's happened now is that it was so beautiful that the owner of the house has taken it over as a meditation pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> is... Thank you so much, Inch, for sharing with us your wonderful and ravishing work. Thank you. Oh, well, thank well, let's you. give Inch another yeah. round of applause. Well, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's the last of our cornucopia of speakers, but we're not quite ready to go yet. Um, we've got a Q&A session and I see that we've got all our speakers back on screen. So at the moment, we're all going to uh, uh, ask everybody to unmute themselves and we're going to open the floor to questions uh, from within uh, the panelists. So um, uh, please fire ahead, those of you who have pressing questions for each other. Alan? Yes. You know that I'm the one that don't, didn't show any work. I mean, any kind <laughs> of like pers personal output you know and uh, is that like going to jail as well or <laughs> i don't we we don't we don't put anyone in jail i think in, 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 before for no, i know i mean ideas. just uh, <laughs> what's your take on that i mean it's uh, sharing you're talking about sharing you know you want people want to know what you do you are up to and that kind of thing and i, I thought like you know what i'm up to is exactly those what those slides show you know I'm, I've, I've been up to a lot of reading i've been up, up to a lot of reflection I've been to a lot of uh, contemplation and all of that, you know, and uh, I just want to know what people think of that. Well, would anyone like to... Uh, to I would like to say something. Um, I think uh, what, um, knowing that uh, this uh, particular Petra culture, um, we, we particularly focus in architecture. Um, and so that's why I would, I would imagine most of our audience would be from a similar background. So that's why I, okay. I was like fully uh, appreciative of what you... Uh, uh, asking us to uh, to read more on, um, but uh, on a normal case, um, if we are doing it in a pub or something, um, I would I would have to have talked to you privately after your practice session. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll behave. I'll behave better oh next time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But it was well, excellent. Personally, <laughs> but personally, I, I found it really enlightening because I think it was yes. really, really important to remember that architects uh, we were part right. of the thinking culture. And we're not some just of, for designing. We're not just for designing nice objects to look at and nice houses. No, but some at. of the drawings I, you know, some of the drawings I own, my own personal work, and you know, I I I put in some sketches and you know uh, illustrations and my own work. But generally, it's not like this is my bungalow. This is my uh, pavilion. This is my you know. I mean, I love yeah. I love seeing people's work, but I I can't bring myself to do that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. But just to just to reassure you. I think, uh, Patricia, you can uh, you can present anything you like. There is no. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's actually much more interesting, uh, more often than not, to know what makes people tick, and not exactly their work. You know, it's more about their passions, about their thoughts, and uh, I don't know. It's it's that sort of uh, behind the scenes. Uh, 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 thoughts that are going on that you usually don't really talk about uh, when mm -hmm. you do a lecture or when you do a presentation yeah. or when you do a, an interview. Uh, mm. So, you know, Pachakcha is the perfect format for, for, for kind of uh, talking behind the scenes. And uh, I'm sure people love this sort of more human side of, uh, of architects. Thank you, Astrid. I feel much better now. <laughs> but, but, you didn't, but you didn't get overly philosophical, so you didn't, it was quite okay. It was a wonderful ramble. So, you know, don't, I wouldn't, it was wonderful. I thought it was fantastic. The problem Thank with getting too philosophical is you can't do it in six minutes, 40 seconds. So you avoided that trap. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, but then again, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's exactly why Pichakcha uh, came about as a format, because, you know, we ramble and ramble and ramble. And, uh, uh, you know, as much as it's uh, interesting to ourselves, uh, I, you can, I can imagine, you know, the, the first row of people is like, hi, next, next, I'm falling asleep, you know. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's where 20 by 20 came came about. Right. right. Are there any other questions from other members of the panel? Uh, I think that the 2020 is, you really have to get it very, very succinct. You, whatever you want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit difficult because you're trying to compress it down to that 20 seconds. Yes. But, but that's the, the other reason, therefore, is, you know, then you have Petractors more often, you know. And uh, and go with that. It's uh, it it sh and I'm a I'm a bad presenter myself. So uh, you know it's kind of a I uh, I don't take it too serious now. And it just it's it's just a pitch actor. It's fine. Actually, it's for six minutes. Actually, so. No, I think it's very good. I, I just think that it, it's very good. You have a very succinct, and you don't bore people because generally you know have a one hour lecture. I gave a seven hour lecture once, and I think it almost killed me. In the audience. Yes. But, but look at it the other way, you know, uh, today, I don't know how many presenters there were, and you learned a little bit of something from everybody. And it, because it was so short and bite-sized, uh, you, you kind of uh, feel you know more now, uh, you know, and uh, you can always follow up with, uh, with people uh, if you want to know more. Again, and, and again, maybe have another pick structure, you know, about some. But you know, Astrid, Astrid, mind you, a, a lot of um, a lot of presentations aren't really done by the people that present them anyway in the big firms. And the nice thing about Petra Kucha is you have to bloody do it yourself. Yes. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be nice if we, we started do, getting a bit more hands on about the bloody work that we claim we do if we're actually doing it. And it's not that, not even in presentations. So I think that's the nice thing about 20 by 20. You have to really put your mind to it. If you don't, then it will, it, will, it, will come off, it will come off as well. So it's a thinking presentation rather than a, a, a yeah? Yeah, yeah. Show Thank you so much for that. Uh, I think Brian is raising his hand. Oh, Brian still moving. Yeah, I've got a little bit of chaos here, but um, there, was a, there was a comment earlier about what's the... Um, why do we need our cameras? Uh, why do we need our video cameras on? And uh, the, shouldn't our work sort of work? Guys, guys, that's a party over here. But uh, um, I, I think that um, we, so an artist recently told me that in this new digital age, uh, the, one of the places that she goes to, the, the first place she goes when she visits a new artist or a designer or an architect's website is to the about page to see what this person is about. It's not their portfolio, it's their face and what they care about and uh, you know what, what kind of photo they decided to put up of themselves. And I think um, when we go to, when we go to uh, a particular night and we, and we get to um, all share in the same atmosphere, it's a really special occasion, but this is equally special in that I can see into each of your different rooms and boxes and um, I, I can actually feel a little bit, I'm a little bit, I mean, I'm physically closer to each of you, uh, you know, even though you're just uh, on my screen. And um, I do think that having, a, having that special insight into this unique experience actually is another layer that uh, it's, it's additive and I think it'll complement our physical event. So um, Quat, thank you for turning your video on. And, uh, <laughs> I know you've been talking about me all the time. <laughs> Well, I didn't know so the much. video was on until everybody started texting me and say, I saw you eating, I saw you wandering about. <laughs> farting, farting. Especially yeah, go, farting. Yeah. So this is what coffee, we all wanted know. to see. We wanted yeah. to see how architects and designers walk around in their own houses in the underwear. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, thank you so much for your contributions. But um, like all cool things must come to an end. And at first, I would like to extend a very big thank you to all you cool cats out there who have joined and spoken on such diverse topics today. Thank you so much for making this Pachacucha such a wonderful event. And let's give ourselves a round of applause. Bravo, bravo. Thank you, thank you. Bravo. Thank you to all the wonderful team at Pachacucha and IDC Architects as well for managing this uh, 
uh, from all behind the scenes. And um, thank you all. Once again, big thank you to all our speakers and to all of you who have logged in to listen to us. Thank you so much for sharing in the artistic uh, culture of, of, uh, of the world. And we hope to see you again someday. Thank you so okay. much. Thanks and for the opportunity. Come to Kuching. Kuching. Come to Kuching. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you Bye. so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Wendy, Bye. Lisa, Bye. Kevin, yes. Francis, Thanks. Astrid, Amy. Bye. Inge. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.